Welcome to Nutakis, my name is Mrs. Rama. In this video, we will be looking at the Grade 12 Paper 1, the 2018 Feb-March Paper. And this video, we'll be looking at Section B. This is to, a video to help the Grade 12s prepare for their exams. Now, before you watch the video, make sure you have the question paper and the memo with you at hand. Right. We're going to work from the terminology because multiple choice is fairly straightforward. And 1.2 1, 1 I've chosen is the terminology because terminology, although many people think it's easy, it's not that easy. And the spelling is very, very important when it comes to terminology. So let's look at the terminology. It says, let's look at the question. Give the correct biological term for each of the following descriptions. Add only the ne term next to the question numbers in the answer booklet. One, two, one. The system in the body that regulates processes by secreting hormones directly into the blood. So a system that secretes hormones directly into the blood, that's the key word, and that you should know as endocrine system. 1.2.2. The farming practice of a growing a sing sorry, the farming practice of a growing a crop of single species only. Now, in 2018, human impact was also included in the exam for the matrix. So it has been taken out of the exam for the matrix, but the grade 11s can still watch this video and learn as well. And growing a crop of a single species only, that is obviously monoculture. One, two, three. The production of male game meats through meiosis. Now, they told us specifically male game meats through meiosis. So your answer cannot be gametogenesis. Gametogenesis is too vague. They specifically said male gametes. So your answer has to be spermatogenesis. One, two, four. The hormone that stimulates the production of milk in a mother after the birth of a baby. Now, production of milk in a mother after the birth of the baby, this hormone is called prolactin. Now, 122.4 has come out in many past papers. Make sure you make a record of it so you always know this. 125. Sharp structures found in plants for protection from herbivores. That's quite easy. Thorns. 126, also a human impact question. The measure of the total amount of carbon dioxide emissions of a person, population, company per year. Well, total amount of carbon dioxide emissions that can only be the carbon footprint. And then 127, plant growth response to an external stimulus. It just said external stimulus. It didn't tell you what stimulus. So here, the answer is quite easily tropism. 1.3. Indicate whether each of the descriptions in column 1 apply to A only, B only, both A and B or none of the items in column 2. Write A only, B only, both A and B or none next to the question numbers in the answer booklet. This question has only three of them because many learners do not follow the instructions in the question and as a result they lose all six marks. Make sure yeah, you follow the instructions. 131. What decreases food security? Now, decreases food security means what will prevent less people from getting food. So, yes, alien plant invasion. Yes, they cover up the space that we could be using to plant our cash crops. Human growth. Yes, the more we grow, then we cannot keep up with the demands to provide food. So, yeah, the answers are both A and B. 132. The use of plant hormones to fight alien plant invasions. Now, a hormone is a chemical substance. So immediately you should know your answer is A only because mechanical control is physically removing the alien plant. So A only, not just A. 133. The hormone secreted by the pituitary gland. Well, you should know here yeah, aldosterone is secreted by the adrenal gland and it is the growth hormone that is only secreted by the pituitary gland. So your answer here yeah, is B only. This was fairly okay to answer, not too difficult. All right. Let's go down to question 1.4. Now, 1.4. 1.4, the diagram below represents a possible path followed by an impulse when a person touches a hot plate. Now, 141, name the path represented by the diagram. So this whole diagram here represents a path. So they want to know what's that path. And the, whenever they mention the word path, that answer can only be the reflex arc. Okay, now 1.4.2. Identify the type of neuron represented by B. 
Now B, you've been used to drawing B and you can see B has many outgrowths from the cell body so it can only be a motor neuron or a multipolar neuron, right? Here the memo has efferent neuron as well. You are comfortable to use whatever word you want to use. C, if you can see C is between the sensory, sorry, this is the motor neuron and this is the sensory neuron. So the neuron between them can only be the connector neuron, even though you might not have learned it. So C is the connector or the interneuron. E, E we just mentioned, can you see? It's a unipolar neuron, but another name that you learned it by is sensory neuron. Right. Give the letter only of the part that represents the receptor. Now, the receptor is usually where the sensory neuron is. So here's your sensory neuron. And so F should be your receptor. Then they ask you the effector. That's easy. Motor neuron always goes to muscles or glands. And so the effector can only be A. Then give the letter and the name of the region where the impulse is transmitted chemically. Now chemically, where the impulse is transmitted chemically, that's by a synapse. So they are asking you to look for the synapse. And if you see from my diagram, there is the synapse, a junction between the two neurons. And so it's D and synapse. Then the part that has an insulating function, this question comes out a lot in the exam. We know it's the myelin sheet, but we can see it's only labeled on this neuron. So G myelin sheet. Okay, that also wasn't too difficult. Right, let's go on to question 1.5. The diagrams below represent two phases of meiosis in an organism. 151. Identify the phase represented by diagram 1. So there's diagram 1. If you look here, you can see your chromosomes are moving apart. But I can see the chromosomes now are unreplicated and the chromosomes are moving apart. So we know apart means anaphase. So that's anaphase. And I teach my kids ana for apart. And of course, can you see the chromosomes are single or unreplicated? And so it has to be anaphase 2. Now, they want you to identify part A. Where's part A? Very easy. That at the pole, that's the centriole. Only the centriole, no other word. Identify part B. That's between the chromosomes. That can only be a centromere. And then C is the spindle fiber. Quite straightforward and easy. 153. State what happens to structure D in the next phase of meiosis. Now, let's look at structure D. Structure D is the chromosome. So they're asking you what happens to structure D in the next phase of the chromosome. Now, the next phase of the chromosome is obviously this part here. And this, what phase is this we're looking at in diagram 2? We're looking at metaphase 2. Meta, meta means middle. I teach my kids meta for middle. The chromosomes are singly arranged, so it's metaphase 2. What's the next thing that's going to happen specifically to the chromosome? We know what's going to happen. The centromere is going to split. So if I draw my diagram like that, the centromere splits okay you could also see the chromatids separate right one five four name the process during which genetic material was ex exchanged as shown in the diagram it's only one mark so it can only be crossing over state the consequence named in state the consequence if the process named in one five one does not occur now we know crossing over brings about genetic variation so if there's no crossing over that will be, there's no genetic variation, or in this case, the memo wanted reduces genetic variation. Okay, because crossing over, why are we saying reduces? Because this is not the only process that brings about crossing over. Oh, I'm sorry, that brings about genetic variation. So that's why we say reduces. 156. Give the number of the chromosomes present in the original parent cell in this organism. Now, this is already meiosis too. Yeah, there's already two chromosomes. So how much chromosomes would have been you know, how many chromosomes would have been present in the first original parent? Obviously four. 
and in a human cell in the same phase as shown in diagram 2. Human cells, somatic cells have 46, but in this phase there would have been 23. Read the question carefully. Make sure they'll ask you in this diagram or in a human cell. Okay, again, not a very difficult question. Right, this is where things get a bit tricky for us. Now, we look at question two. The graph below shows the concentration of progesterone in a woman's blood during the early stages of pregnancy. Now, if you can see this graph, they have the progesterone levels in the y-axis, they have the gestation periods in weeks, and they're showing how this progesterone levels are increasing. Now, this question is 12 marks, so let's get down to answering. 211. Name two structures responsible for producing progesterone during pregnancy. Key word is during pregnancy. So we already know what produces progesterone. That will be the corpus luteum. And maybe you're getting stuck for the second one, but never forget the second one is the placenta. Then, 212. Describe the general trend in the change in progesterone levels in the woman's blood during the early stages of pregnancy. So this is the early stages of pregnancy. Can you see what's happening to the amount of progesterone? The progesterone levels are increasing. And that's all you say. For one mark, the progesterone levels are increasing. Right. 213. Describe the negative feedback mechanism that occurs between progesterone and FSH during pro pregnancy. Two marks. This is a very, very, very important question. Make sure you make a note of this matrix. It's a question that's likely to come out again. So, 213. What do they want? They want negative feedback, meaning you must have a high amount, which will bring about a reaction to a decrease. So, you must have the word high and low in your answer. So let's see what the memo says. Yes, high levels of progesterone inhibit the amount or um, inhibit or decrease the secretion of FSH. I would have just said high levels of progesterone inhibit FSH, but there's also a decrease as well. So you can use either or here. The memo is not too rigid. 214. State the importance of the negative feedback mechanism. Okay. When a woman is pregnant, she cannot get pregnant again because of this, that these high levels of pregnancy will not allow another follicle to develop. And so there cannot be any ovulation and no fertilization can take place. So what does the memo want? Prevents the growth of a new follicle or ovulation during pregnancy. Okay, right. 215. Calculate the percentage increase in progesterone levels between week 4 and week 14. So they want to know the percentage increase. So we take 39.5 minus 21.6 and look at the answer we get 17.9. Now they want it to be, they want the percentage increase. So it's the difference between the two numbers over the first number. Okay, so we got the difference, that's 17.9, and first number that you're coming across between week 4 and 14 is 21.6, multiplied by 100, 82.87, don't forget the unit percent. Okay, 216, the woman's progesterone level in week 16 was 25 nanograms per milliliter. Right, so if you look at week 16, are they telling you it was 25? Explain why this woman should be concerned. Now, can you see at 16, the levels are decreasing. Why should she be concerned? Now, remember, the progesterone levels must carry on being high so it can maintain the placenta. So what's going to happen? The placenta will not be maintained. It can either detach, she can have a miscarriage, or menstruation can begin. That's what the memo wants. That's all very, very bad for this woman. Okay, she might lose her baby. B, suggest one way in which this problem could be treated. One way, easy, we have to increase her progesterone levels again. So how do you do that? Progesterone supplements. Okay, All right, so that was question 2.1. Let's get down to question 2.3. Question 2.2, I've omitted because it was a human impact question. So we got just going to do the questions that apply to the grade 12s. Right, 2.3. The diagram below shows part of the human ear. There's the ear here, right? Now, 
Let's look at what question they're asking. 231. The part of the brain that receives impulses from part A and B. Now, A and B is responsible for balance. What part of the brain is responsible for balance? And that can only be the cerebellum. Many kids get confused with this, so make sure you learn this well. Name the part of the brain receives impulses from C. That's the cochlea. It's responsible for hearing. Which part interprets sound? That can only be the cerebrum. 232. Name the receptor. What picks up? What's responsible for picking up the stimulus of, of sound? And that is the organ of corti. And then 233. Explain two ways in which part A. It's a semicircular canals is structurally suited to maintain balance. Now, this question came out in the Gauteng Prelim 2022 as well. So, an adaptation or how a structure is suited is how the structure helps the function. So, here you will see the semicircular canals contain the fluid. So, when the person moves, right, it picks up movement. There's crusty in the semicircular canals that convert the stimulus to an impulse. Right? And the canals, as you can see, it lies in three different planes. So it can pick up movement in any of those three directions. It's a nice question. Make sure you learn this or make a note of it in your special metric book. Right. 2.4. 2.4 is based on the eye. The diagram below shows the structure of the human eye. Right. There's the eye. Let's take a look at the diagram. Quite fairly straightforward. Identify part B. Now, part B, can you see it's pointing to that black part, the middle part? And that part always comes out. If you watch my exam prep videos, it always comes out. That is the choroid. Right? Then, part C. Part C is the outer layer. And that is the sclera. Now, 242. Explain the effect on a person's vision of part E is cut. Now, part E, you should know already is the optic nerve. That's the optic nerve that transmits the impulses to the cerebrum for interpretation. Now, if that cannot happen, then can the impulse go to the cerebrum for interpretation? No. And if that does not happen, can the person see? No. The person is blind. So they want the effect on the person's vision. So what does the memo have? The person cannot see, is blind, has no binocular vision, because the impulses from the retina cannot be transmitted to the cerebrum. Straightforward. 243. Part D can be damaged by a very bright light. Part D is the retina. Right. And in the retina are your photoreceptor cells, right? So they tell you part D can be damaged by a very bright light. Describe how part A, which is the iris, how it protects the retina from bright light. So they are asking now bright light. That's the key and it's four marks. So what does the iris do? Now this they're asking us about the pupillary mechanism in bright light. Here you should know the circular muscles of the iris contract. You must say the iris. The radial muscles relax. The pupil constricts to let less light in and that will protect the retina by allowing too much light to enter on the retina. Nice question. 244. Four. In a condition called presbyopia, lenses lose their elasticity and therefore maintain a constant flat shape. A. How this condition will affect a person's vision? Four marks. So, how does presbyopia, your lens, cannot um, maintain a flat shape? Okay. So, of course, your lens has to change shape for accommodation. So, let's see what happens. Accommodation cannot take place. The lens will not be able to refract. Well, oh, we can say the refractive power of the lens is low. The light rays cannot be refracted. A clear image will not be focused on the retina. And then the person cannot focus on objects that are closer than six meters. That's exactly presbyopia is what happens to our parents when they lose, when this is what happens to their lenses and they cannot see uh, near. Then they have to move their paper in all directions so they can see clearly. So, nice question this is. Suggest the shape of the lens that may be prescribed by the doctor to correct this disorder. That's easy. A convex lens. I'm glad to see that the memo is also accepting biconvex as well.
Right, that was 2.4. 3.4, we jumped straight to 3.4 again because there were a lot of questions on human impact and it wasn't necessary for the grade 12s and I didn't want to do that. So I jumped straight to the questions that apply to the grade 12s. This is an investigation question. Now, 3.4. An investigation was carried out to determine the influence of alcohol on the volume of urine produced. 12 healthy 23-year-old males of similar height and mass participated in the investigation. The investigation was conducted as follows. The men were divided into two groups of six each, A and B, group A and B. The two groups ate the same food and did the same exercise for the 24-hour period before testing. Each group was given the following to drink after the 24-hour period. Group A, one litre of alcohol-free beer, beer that does not contain alcohol, and Group B had one litre of alcoholic beer. Then urine was collected from each, from each man every hour. Assume the volume of urine collected is equal to the volume of urine produced. And here's your results for the investigation. You have your time of collection and the average volume of urine collected in millilitres for Group A and B. Now, they are asking you, what is the dependent variable for this investigation? Now, dependent variable is what you are measuring. So I would teach you, always go to the beginning. Can you see it says there to determine the influence of alcohol on the volume of urine? And that's your aim. In your aim is your dependent variable. So what are you measuring here? Yes, you are measuring the volume of urine. State. Next question. State two planning steps investigators had to take before the investigation could start. Now, this is your planning steps. They must decide, of course, very important, time, place, date on the experiment, see, on the investigation. What apparatus, they must decide on the apparatus they might need. How to record the data, the number of participants, that is your sample size, what factors to keep constant, What's the composition of the sample? They must get an indemnity form for the participants to sign, or they could get permission from the volunteers to part that are going to participate. Nice answers. Whatever you would have said would have been included in your answer. But try and write down a few that come out all the time. As you notice, sample size, number of participants, how to record data, apparatus, and time, those usually come out often. Okay, so there they only wanted two. Then, C. State two factors that need to remain constant other than the ones already mentioned. So there are ones that I mentioned you already other than those ones. Make sure you read your question carefully. Now, when it says constant, you must start off with the word same. So, of course, I would have immediately said the men were going to drink the same type of beer. Right? It was the same apparatus that was going to be used for them and the same person was going to do the investigation throughout the experiment. Here the memo also says the same room and no other liquid intake by both groups. Okay, that's good. I would have never said that. I would have only said same type of beer, same investigator throughout the experiment and the same apparatus or materials or equipment throughout the experiment. Right, three, four, one. D. Two steps that the investigator took to ensure reliability. Now, reliability is always repeating the investigation, increasing the sample size. But they say state two steps that the investigator investigators took. That means it's already here in the passage. You just have to just select them. So what did they do? They had a large sample size, as you can see, which is 12 men. And what did they do? Look at it they measured the average volume of urine produced okay so make sure make sure you know when an average is collected that is also a way to increase reliability 342 based on the results explain how the intake of alcohol influences the secretion of adh and consequently the volume of urine that is produced by the kidneys what a lovely question amazing amazing question i love this question now, I'm not sure if you know this, but alcohol reduces the secretion of ADH. It causes the renal tubules to become less permeable to water and more water is lost in the urine. So a male can or a person that drinks alcohol can lose a lot of water and can eventually become dehydrated. Make a note of this question. This is very, very nice for you to know. Okay, and that was question 3.4. That was a nice question. Question 3.5. Now. Plants. The diagram below shows two plants, A and B, 
at the start of investigation, the plants were treated in the following ways. No changes were made to plant A. The apical bud, as you can see, was removed from plant B. Each plant was covered with a box with a single opening. Yes, we can see that, as shown in the diagram, and placed in a lit room. 3.5.1. State the role of the boxes in the investigation. I like this question. Why do you think the box has one hole on the side? Of course, to allow the plant to receive light from one direction. Okay, as you can see there in the memo. 3.5.2. What? Name the hormone that is removed by cutting off the apical bud from plant B. So, which hormone was removed? Of course, in the tip of the bud, that can obviously be only oxen. 3.5.3. Tabulate two differences between plant A and B that you will expect after two weeks. Now, of course, plant A, obviously, we know is going to plant grow towards the light, which will become phototropic. And no, plant B is going to just grow straight. Plant A will not have any lateral branches, but because that tip is cut, plant B will have many lateral branches. Plant A will be much taller and B, plant B will be much shorter. A very nice question. Can you see it's five marks? So you make sure you have your heading for your table. You have your table drawn properly with the headings, the columns, and the rows. That's your extra mark. All of that for one. Three, five, four. The diagram below shows plant B seven days after being sprayed with gibberellin. Gib sorry, the diagram below shows plant B seven days after being sprayed with gibberellins. Explain the effect that gibberellins had on the plant by referring to changes observed in the diagram. So, can you see what happened here? The length increased, so it caused the stem to grow longer by causing the internodes to become longer. Okay, and that's one of the functions of gibberellins. Section C. In 2018, there still used to be essays. So, I still like to do this because the essays can be taken and made into short questions for you now for your exam. Let's look at it. Question 4. Protection, nourishment and gases exchange are important requirements for the successful development of an embryo. Describe how gases exchange and nourishment of the embryo occur in an amniotic egg and how gases exchange and nourishment as well as protection of the fetus occur in humans. This is a lovely question, an amazing question. So we comparing the amniotic egg, gases exchange and nourishment compared to how it is in humans, in a fetus. All right, let's look at what the memo wanted. Only in those days, it was only 17 facts and three marks for synthesis. So let's look at it. In an amniotic egg, how does gases exchange take place? By diffusion? into and out of the egg through the shell, right, or the allantoy or the chorion. So the learner could have said anything. Nourishment of the embryo in the, am in the amniotic egg, it's the yolk or the albumin that will provide nutrients to the embryo. Let's talk about gases exchange and nourishment in the fetus now. In the placenta, the mother's blood comes into close contact with the fetal blood. Oxygen and nutrients diffuse from the mother's blood into the fetal blood in the umbilical vein. This nutrient-rich blood is carried to the fetus through the umbilical cord. Carbon dioxide diffuses from the fetal blood into the umbilical artery and then into the, into the maternal blood. Are you noticing they're saying from the mother's blood into the fetal blood, from the fetal blood into the maternal blood or mother's blood? Please make sure when you ask this, you always ask specific. Right. Protection of the fetus in humans. The fetus develops inside the uterus protected by the mother's body. There are antibodies from the mother's blood that pass into the fetus blood to provide immunity. The placenta acts as a microfilter to prevent toxins from the mother's blood from entering the fetal blood. Fetus is enclosed in an amnion with amniotic fluid that provides protection against dehydration, acts as a shock absorber and a suitable temperature regulator for developing embryos. Wow, this is actually an amazing, amazing question. If it was me, I'd take little parts of it and write it in the relevant sections. Make sure you learn this. They can ask you this in a short question or a comparison question. All right, thank you, Grade 12. Thank you for joining me and watching this video. I hope you learned a lot. Join me and watch all my other videos as well.